Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, John Hubbard, and we've been going through our uh, 11 strategies of a world-class cybersecurity operations center uh, season here. And um, Which, by the way, you have two options to, uh, to listen to now. You can listen on the traditional podcast format, as we've been doing, but I also wanted to call out here uh, that we have been doing videos of these episodes as well. So for anyone who's interested in seeing our smiling faces or just kind of seeing what this is all about and, and how this looks, uh, we have all, all of these posted on the SANS Cyber Defense YouTube channel for anyone interested in sharing those links or cutting to specific parts of the episode. It might be easier for that. So we'll put the link for that in the show notes for anyone that wants to see the video version of what we're going on uh, or what's been going on here. Again with me, we've got our amazing show guests uh, and our author team, uh, Ingrid Parker and Carson Zimmerman and Kat Nerler. And we're going to dive in today talking about data, uh, what to collect, why we need to collect certain things, the different types of things we might collect, the signatures and other things like that, uh, all about collecting the right data so that we can make those detections and, and stop advanced attacks. So really excited to, to start this one off. So as a question to get us going here, uh, could one of you speak to a um, little bit about what inspired you know, this chapter in the book and, and what it's all about and uh, where this conversation is going to take us? So as we were thinking about this particular topic, we knew it was important to continue um, talking about data compared to the first edition. And, and for the audience who may not be aware, this is actually a second edition of the book. The first one came out back in 2014. So it's it's been a while since then. Um, and what we really looked at is what has that transformation been in terms of collection strategies, the types of data available, what we were looking at. And really at the time that the first edition came out, network-based um, collection and analysis was still really, really important to how ASOC did, and it was still kind of the fundamental thing you were looking at. Endpoint um, data was just starting to come into play. And as we started into here, we noticed um, like, hey, that's completely switched. You know, Endpoint is where you're going. From a government perspective, there's been um, a lot of, uh, here in the US, a lot of policies that have come out saying, hey, you must collect this now. This is the direction we're going. This is what you need to put into play. And really, when you start thinking about what's happened in the network space, the kind of encryption that's been going on, the um, limit of visibility, you know, the kinds of unique things that are happening um, within your endpoints, you really needed to start switching to that. And then even as we were writing the book and even into now, we've noticed um, a switch over to really that identity piece and thinking about, um, you know, less about what's happening on a particular endpoint and what's happening with that person, that system, that identity that you have, and how is that becoming uh, both a place where you need to be logging and collecting and a place that's being exploited as well. So really, um, you know, over the last 20 years, uh, you know, there's been this this whole shift. Um, and that's something that we started to capture in the book and things that were probably hit on a little bit more as we're talking today. Awesome. Yeah, I love the word you use there, kind of transformation, right, of where we have been to where maybe you were when you wrote this book, not even that long ago to where we're going now, right? Um, we oh. have a lot of options for collecting data. And I'm, I'm sure our listeners are wondering, like, okay, so I still have maybe some network data encryption, maybe hiding some of it from me, maybe they can decrypt, maybe they can't. Uh, we have endpoint data, and we have, you know, identity and, and other kind of stuff like that, that's, that's playing a bigger and bigger role. And um, what's going on with our accounts over time. Where should somebody start with this? Is this a question of looking out at your data and saying, well, here's what I got, let's collect that? Or is there a more uh, kind of targeted approach that you would suggest for people to take? Oh, I can start. Um, this topic that you're you're asking about, John, is, is interestingly one that's full of emotion um, and fear and loathing and success and hatred and happiness upon almost anyone you know, who's ever worked in a security operations center, myself included, um, you know, piling onto what Ingrid said, when I first started doing this now over 20 years ago, uh, we, we started from the place of, you know, some people felt like, and this is an oversimplification, slap a network sensor on it and you're good. And, you know, we now all recognize that's absolutely not the case. In fact, it kind of wasn't really the case to begin with, but we recognize that we need to think about multiple dimensions um, in terms of both breadth and depth of coverage. You know, I've spoken about this at SANS included, you know, about this pretty extensively. And the topic of data collection and retention um, is one that because it is so wide and so deep, puns intended, 
um, often feels daunting for folks. And one of the ways that I think about this space is taking an iterative and self-reinforcing approach. Um, there are, you know, two or three aspects to this. It's uh, establishing the governance uh, that compels your constituents, your customers, the people you're protecting to generate and transmit the data to you or to themselves necessary for security. Um, it's measuring that along multiple dimensions, not just coverage, but we, you know, we, uh, you know, including things like uh, attack coverage and such, um, and, and also building up the use cases for it. And, and that's the third is building up, building up those detection analytic and forensic investigative um, use cases. And one of the ways people are like, oh my God, I've got all these things to do. It seems like we'll never get done. And one of the ways I always like to get anybody starting, it doesn't matter how big you are, is let's, let's focus a, a couple people on the sock and perhaps a, a partner in the enterprise around specific use cases um, or threats of concern. And what this allows the SOC to do is build a rhythm to collecting data and doing something about it and showing value and showing victories in partnership with the people it's, uh, it's protecting. And if you can do that, you can build energy and you can build momentum. And if you do that, and then you keep do and you do those other two things along the way, um, you know, you get, you keep going in the way, in the direction you should be going. What I would advise against is taking an absolutist approach where say, oh, you know, we've got to, we've got to put in place the governance to collect all the things from all the things. And we're not going to get started till we're done with that because you never get to a hundred percent. Right. And I'll add to that. Um, one of, one of the first places that I like to start is looking at if you have uh, a history of the incidents that have occurred in your environment, uh, just to kind of feel for, okay, what kinds of data might have helped us illuminate this faster? Um, what kinds of um, data do I need to look at this stuff? And also, um, how many locations are we talking about? Um, one of the things we talk about in the book is if you're geographically dispersed, how does that play into the designs and the data that you have? And just some overall thinking about where do I want to analyze that data? Do I want to have some locally, if it's really large, uh, transporting large data sets like PCAP across large networks, um, doesn't make that much sense. And it may be, make more sense to keep something locally and then pass back um, the results of analysis to a more central place. So it depends on how big or small you're talking about, but that needs to play into the use cases that Carson just described. I'll, I'm going to mention one thing because people are probably wor thinking about it and worrying about it here. And, and I would, I want to defer some segment of this conversation to strategy eight. And that is, is we all dream and we all spend a lot of time getting more data into our seam or a log management solution or a big data solution or whatever it is that you as the soccer are using to collect security relevant data. By all means, keep doing more of that. We're all here doing more of that. However, uh, I think one of the things to keep in perspective is exactly what Catherine is talking about. That is, is that the SOC will never have all of imp its important data in a SIM, uh, short of having infinite resources, which no one has. You will never have all of your security data in your SIM. I'm sorry, it's not happening. And the reason why I make that remark is as you continue having incidents, and as you mature and as the enterprise changes and matures, more data will come up. So you're going to constantly be going from, you know, I know the data exists to I have it in my seam. And you'll never be 100%. So one of the important things for the SOC to do is to be at peace with that and build into its processes the things that take it from, I know the data that exists to I can use it to I have it, while still leveraging a lot of data in place. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a good point to make is is there's never that like, hey, we're done here, right? We've collected all the things and we have a perfect auditing policy and we have a perfect this and that because attacks are going to change, the environment's going to change. And so it's an it's a never shifting target, right? Um, as people 
continue to add more and more data, uh, there's something that's going to happen, right? The bill is going to continue to increase. The storage is going to continue to increase. And so could you speak a little bit about what do we do as things approach too much to handle the volume that's going to inevitably start piling on to the point where maybe we can't pay for it or handle it or search through it all anymore? Is there a sweet spot? How do we approach uh, solving that problem? I can, I can offer some examples. It's all about how important it is to you. And it goes back to the point that Catherine made about having that federated and diverse and vibrant data estate that the SOC leverages every day. Um, I want to offer um, a network events, a host, host flow data. It's known as host flow data to some, meaning uh, telemetry that talks about what processes are connecting to what hosts on the network and when uh, data is telem tremendously voluminous, more voluminous than process creation events. Process creation events and logon events are um, generally speaking in the two most voluminous data anyone will collect. Um, I've spent you know, many years in my career doing that, getting really good at collecting that kind of data. And it's really rewarding. Um, and it's absolutely essential to um, detections, investigation, and response on the host. And, you know, none of us are here to endorse any specific vendors. And we exp expressly disclaim that in the book. However, um, if the SOC decides it's going to go buy an EDR or a product like it, it doesn't need to do that anymore. In fact, um, there's a very good chance that EDR doesn't collect and retain every single process creation event and every network event because it doesn't need to. Um, so we must constantly be looking for strategies um, to push down those trend, those collection, generation, transmission, persistence, and query costs because our data estate keeps fettering. We also must, and again, this is foreshadowing to, to strategy eight, be pursuing um, strategies that hold that different data at different cost and performance structures. You can't have it all in SSD. Yeah, to add, uh, in talking about storage, um, I, I think that uh, some of it depends on the size. So if you have vol voluminous uh, data, like the, the, the process logs that Carson was talking about, you're probably not going to keep it very long. So you, you want some strategies that you're thinking about up front. What do you keep and how for how long? Because that really dictates, I mean, how much storage do you need? Do you have um, what drives up cost are things like, um, are you pushing things over a network? Um, so you're you're hitting your network bandwidth. Are you hitting storage? Storage has gone down quite a bit in price, um, but it's not free, right? Um, and then the ability to pull back um, data out of storage to, to analyze it, that can also, these are all things that cost together when you, they start driving your cost up the more you do it and the more you build on things. So um, uh, alerts and things like that are that are smaller sized, you can probably keep months and months and months, years, two plus years, something like that. When you're talking about something where you're collecting all the process traffic, um, maybe that's a few days or a week. You know, so there's a, a vast difference and you have to think about it up front about what you want to keep and how long and how accessible it is. Part of that question is, is something hot you like you want it immediately available to you versus I need to go back and archive somewhere and pull it up, but it might take a few hours or a day or two. So you got to think about some of that storage stuff that um, system administration, I, I think Ingrid or Carson mentioned about partnering with your IT. This is a place where you can partner with your IT organization on what to store and, and how much. And I'd want to hit two points from all that, which is doing data collection is not a set it and forget it. This is, and it's not even a annual process. It needs to be much more ongoing to the whole point of when we opened, we were talking about, hey, the kinds of places that you want to collect from has changed over time. But the fact is, even in a fairly static environment, the volume that you're going to get out of certain tools is going to change, even within a year. Mm -hmm. um, and the relative importance of that, especially if you're taking a threat-based approach where you're starting to say, hey, what are adversaries doing? How are they doing it? What have they been changing over this year? That's going to change what you want to be able to collect on as well. 
So build in something that's going to allow you to routinely go back and say, okay, where are we getting the data from? How much of it are we actually using? How much of it is just creating a bunch of noise that we have to sort through every day, but it's actually not producing actionable alerts that we're going to move forward with? Maybe you do some tuning from there. Um, you know, maybe that's a place where you you start from a higher collection standpoint and you start tuning down, or maybe you're starting from a place where we're just going to bring in a little bit of, of information and like, oh, okay, now we can add on more. Now we can add on more. But especially for all of this, um, have a strategy for how you're going to go through and evaluate the data that you're bringing in, where you're storing it, how frequently you're accessing it, everything else, um, and have the plan for how you're going to look at that over time, because it is not going to stay stay the same. Wherever you start on day one with your ZOC, that's not not where you're going to land. Uh, I'll offer two points to pile on to what, what Ingrid just mentioned, um, including a couple tangible points. Um, the SOC, to her point, needs to be evaluating the health of its feeds every day. Mm -hmm. Every day for every feed. You can automate this. I've spoken publicly, again, at SANS. Go look me up on YouTube. Um, there are pretty straightforward ways to do that. Um, if your sensor or feed agent shows green, that does not necessarily mean you are green. You may be suffering from what some people call the watermelon effect. The sock must be evaluating um, the flow and completeness of every major data feed um, at least every seven days, usually every 12 or 24 hours. Feeds break constantly. And the more feeds you have, the more often they break. Um, so having that kind of monitoring in place is very important. Um, you know, one of the things to be thoughtful about, imagine the SOC is, is, is one of the points Ingrid talked about in the context of the diversity of its data estate. Imagine the SOC is responsible for an enterprise that has 100 distinct, distinct services or applications in it. It is likely that the SOC feels it necessary, perhaps it even has governance, to compel each of those 100 application owners to produce telemetry at an application or service level. Not just host, not just network, not just cloud resources, application layer telemetry. It is a, there's a very good chance the SOC will never look at any of that, any of the data for a given application for over a year. However, what happens if the service gets popped? So one of the things we have to be thoughtful about in putting together that overall data collection strategy is, you know, even if we're not looking at it, it might still be important. And who's responsible for collecting it? Um, and retaining it, um, you know, when we have to think about some of the regulatory pieces there, um, is there PII involved? Does that change what data you can retain? Um, so there's some complexities and some, some thought that needs to be given towards this and that every SOC has to make its own choices. Is there a, um, a clear way that you approach finding broken feeds? Is it as simple as this is a source that normally reports and now it went to zero rate of collection from that particular IP address or host name? Or is there something fancier that you would suggest people use to try to detect uh, when things are not there anymore? That is the number one way I do it. Um, and I'll offer a couple points because this is so critical to so much the SOC does I'm going to dive in for two minutes. Doing it on a per server basis, unless that server is subject to extreme regulatory or audit scrutiny is probably over aggressive. Like if you have a thousand, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of servers, that might be difficult. However, taking a moving average weighted approach to where if you see data go way high or way low against a moving average measured along multiple dimensions, including by service area, um, you know, by region, by some slice that makes the SOC happy, I have found over the course of many years to be a ruthlessly effective way of finding dead, um, dead or broken data feeds. Um, and it's very easy to instrument. What I would advise people against is building static lists. <laughs> Don't build static lists. Have the system automatically build the list from what it's seen before and compare that against what it's seen recently. And this kind of analysis can be done in a single query that can be run on a timer. 
And it might not ca catch something in 15 minutes, although you could. You could do it very quickly. Um, I have found this effect, this to be absolutely superb at finding dead data feeds time and time again. That's awesome. And I, and I think this anomaly based is also helpful because dead data feeds are important, but also changes in your feeds. Because if you are suddenly getting more or less volume, you might not have, you might have a feed that is still transmitting, but somebody has changed the configuration. There's been a detector that's been added. There's something is going on that has changed and you need to go investigate. So it's not just an up down. It's also a, is this pretty typical um, and what you expected? Yeah. Yeah. That's such an important thing for people to understand, you know, what normal is and then be able to detect, right. Have that problem sensitivity where they can say, wait a minute, something's changed, right. That's kind of the, the first thread you start to pull and then you get, you know, of course you after have, have to answer, is it good? Is it bad? Is it, you know, whatever, but, um, just being able to see that there is a meaningful difference is I think the, the core kind of piece of the problem for a lot of that stuff. Uh, there was another thing that you had mentioned along the way, Ingrid, kind of a couple minutes ago that uh, that was in the book, and I, I wanted to highlight just because I think it's a thing that a lot of people don't even think about. Uh, and you kind of mentioned it in passing, but um, the tune up from from zero versus kind of tune down from what's there. The kind of two different approaches for alerts or even log collection as well, right? Um, what would be the reason someone would choose one versus the other? Because, you know, I, I think most people probably are like, I don't know, turn it on, see what comes in, and then we turn off what we don't like. But why would someone go in the other direction? Um, I think there are a few things to start with. One is just, you know, how big are you? What's your budget? Are you, you know, if you're a smaller organization that doesn't have a huge budget, um, getting that overwhelming amount of data in is not going to set you up to be able to do anything with it. And especially if you're starting to initially try and show value for your security operations center, you you actually will do that by having less data that comes in that is more curated around the threats that are important to you so that you can go be looking for those in a more systematic way. Um, and then you can expand from there to try and bring in additional information as you're like, oh, I wish we would have also had this. This would have helped with my investigation and everything else. It is so easy to get overwhelmed and so easy to then just say, okay, here's 100 alerts that I have to go through that really are just not important. And you're not focusing in on the things that you need to be looking at. So I think especially for newer or smaller socks, it's a great way um, to be a little bit more focused and then add on as you go through. Um, you know, if you're maybe a more established SOC and, hey, you've got a new business unit or you're trying to bring in a new data source, you might be able to go ahead and ingest that bigger part and more quickly be able to tune down because you already kind of know what you're looking for and you've got that experience within your organization. Gotcha. So it's a little bit of a time versus, uh, you know, do you have to do a bunch of work before you turn it on versus uh, let's just turn it on. We can afford it for now and we'll fix it as we go kind of play, I guess. Uh, might yep. be one way of putting it. Um, something else that was mentioned, kind of even in, before that, you all kind of in, in series hit all the questions I wanted to ask, and I was like, oh, wait a minute, I got that one, that one, that one. <laughs> so um, one of the other things I wanted to ask is is with all of this data coming in, right? Um, is there any logic? And there's there's a table in the book that mentions this, and I wanted to ask about it. Uh, retention minimums. Um, what? should someone be thinking about when they're looking at their network data or their endpoint data they're like there's a lot of it is it worth keeping it for a month or a year like what do people actually need can you speak a little bit uh, on how someone might decide that yeah so i'll start with that one um so this is that big big question so what are you using the data to do are you using it to uh, go back and find an incident and trace back where else was the incident you know scoping an incident so you need to be able to go back. And I think Carson uh, had mentioned it earlier about, I, I may not be looking at it right now, but I know I'm going to need it in three months when we find an incident, right? So you want to hold on to it. So one of the first things to think about is, I'm gonna, am I going to need something immediately right now um, to monitor? So am I looking to find stuff? If I'm looking for alerts and what I'm uh, initially finding things, I want the information and data to be available immediately when I'm going to be using the data to go back in time and find things, you don't have to keep that online and immediately available. So you can um, you can have off offsite storage or whatever you're going to do for some of that stuff as it gets bigger and bigger. So it's kind of optimizing it for expected use, right? You, the stuff that you're going right. to search every day, you're going to have on your dashboard. That's the like, keep it on the fastest storage, keep it all there. And then there's the like, forensically, we might use this someday, but it's cheaper to keep offline, you know, and, and just have a priority and, and task oriented approach. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, I'll that, off, that's, I'll off, oh, go ahead. I was going to offer a couple points to pond to what Catherine said. And actually, I think one of the points 
um, Ingrid or Catherine mentioned we were talking about strategy five, and that is, is getting to patient zero and that initial infection vector. And this is where the SOX persistent memory of previous incidents can be a very good driver. Um, you know, we've seen in major industry breaches, um, in fact, you know, you can go look at Verizon Deaver, Mandy and M Trends, or, you know, pick your major um, general industry metrics report, Intel report, you know, the big sweeping ones where we talk about the typical dwell time for an adversary. And I have seen folks, uh, SOX have a lot of success in terms of talking about the, the median or mean dwell time for the adversary as direct and persistent justification, pun intended, for its log retention um, governance. Um, and in my experience, um, and this would certainly not apply to PCAP, absolutely not apply to PCAP, um, but it would certainly apply to things like identity logs, host logs, uh, uh, cloud logs, application logs, is that's usually measured in months. Yeah. Um, but to a point that Ingrid mentioned earlier, um, someone may find it difficult to create, to um, retain and keep at the highest layer of access every process creation event, AKA in Windows 4688, or its equivalent in uh, Audit D, you know, online in SSD for six months, that might be too much for you. And that's okay. And there's lots of strategies to minimize that by putting it lower tiers and to summarizing that data. Hey, I don't necessarily need to know that foo.exe ran at exactly this time, you know, on a host six months ago, but I can at least know that it was run on a host six months ago. And then I can go somewhere else that's much cheaper to get the details. Strategies like those are paramount. Yeah. So, and I actually want to say one other thing, which is, as an analyst, I want all the data from all time readily accessible, live and hot. Like, I, I want to make sure we're acknowledging that. Like, we know, <laughs> we get it. Um, you know, please just make yeah. it all available, and I'll go find what I need. Uh, these strategies are because, unfortunately, from a um, processing storage cost, you know, everything else perspective, it just isn't realistic for most socks. And so we just, we want to acknowledge, we feel your pain, um, but these yeah. are things to, you know, to, to deal with the reality of what's actually available and what you can work with. Huh. Yeah. And, and just to add on to all of this, um, there are some creative things you can keep like changes in process. So you have what should be happening, say, you know, windows registry kinds of things. If those start changing in their traditional, that would be good to have a log of that, right? So you don't have to keep absolutely everything that, that's changing, just the, the interesting things that might come into play. So you can be a little creative with that. Sometimes that in itself takes a lot of thought, though, because you're trying to script things and keep it. It's much easier to just keep everything for all time. It's a lot harder to think about, I really need these kinds of things, changes in processes, changes in you know whatever it is, especially identity and moving around. I'd like to address something that, that Catherine just mentioned, because another elephant in the room in all this, particularly application, SAS, PaaS type logs, there's usually this back and forth between the SOC and its customers about, well, what data should we collect? I don't know. What do you need? Well, you know, and then they go back and forth and every kind of throws up their hands and be like, ah, give up. Um, and I think it's actually pretty simple for most folks. Um, the easiest way, in my opinion, to get started in having a conversation about it, that layer of abstraction, not host, not network, not firmware, um, but the the PaaS, SaaS, application service level logs is um, CRUD, log in, log out, and uh, administrative actions, meaning create, read, update, delete. If you can do CRUD, log in, log out, and administrative actions, at a service and application layer, that's usually a good place to get started and can bound, give very concrete, very good actionable, um, you know, go do's to the owners. And it usually gives a really good start for the SOC to get going and being able to go investigate an incident should one happen. And you can say that, what I just said in less than 10 pages of policy. Yeah, no, I like that approach. A nice, simple kind of 
practical. We need to know what is high risk and who's doing it and when they're doing it and what they're doing, right? Because uh, right. nearly every attack is going to be illuminated by that set of logs in some way, even if you don't know what specific attack you might be looking for, which ideally you do. But uh, that was a, a topic for the, the threat intelligence episode, right? So to, to keep moving on this one, um, that was kind of all in the realm of planning detection. And obviously, there's a lot of competing priorities to be balanced there between budget and volume and everything else. Uh, I want to move on to like kind of the, the second and third parts of this chapter. And, and for the listeners, this is a very big chapter. And we had to debate what parts of this we were going to hit. So we didn't make this a, a whole season on its own. <laughs> so I definitely encourage everyone listening to go read through this chapter because there's a lot more meat that we're going to be able to cover in one episode here. But uh, the next section was about intrusion detection and just kind of the, the different approaches with different types of rules. Uh, before we get into host versus network data sources and all of that, I did want to ask at least one question about this section, which is, um, um, could you tell the users a little bit about the different types of signatures in that, you know, there's behavior and anomaly signatures versus the ones directly detecting, a, you know, something like hash or, you know, sign of evil and how you balance kind of your rule set between those two different types and what they're good for kind of in their own camps? Okay, I can start with that one. Um, so, you know, the general... The general types are signature based and behavioral based. We can break most things down into those two generalized categories. Um, for signature based, um, those are they they can be static. They can also be very creative and do kind of a correlation kinds of things, uh, looking for patterns and pattern recognition. You can use that from a signature based perspective. Um, signature based is limited. Uh, we do still use it today. But what I would suggest when, when I'm doing this in SOX today is I look for certain places in certain networks putting together certain kinds of patterns. If you see uh, a particular bespoke signature deep in your network somewhere, deep in your cloud, um, that's really bad. So that's how I use signature base when I'm uh, these days when I'm trying to do something. Network based is certainly very limited in what it can do. Um, the other kind is behavioral are heuristic. So looking at, and actually Carson kind of mentioned it when he was talking about, uh, you know, sensing whether a feed is on or off. So looking at changes, what is normal uh, or baseline and what change? And really it's a, a relative change. So if something looked a certain way for an hour and then changed to another way it looked at the next hour, then that's kind of interesting. So it's looking at heuristics and patterns and behaviors of, of users. The traditional um, example that we use is a user is typically working from nine to five and that's their corporate network. Um, suddenly there's a login at 3 a.m. Well, then there's a question. Did that person log in at 3 a.m. or is there something else happening on their account and their identity? Is there um, some, uh, actually, let me, let me back up and rephrase that. When we're looking at anomaly detections, right? We know every attack is an anomaly in some factor. You, you, maybe you're logging that factor, maybe you're not, but not every anomaly is an attack, right? So inherently, your anomaly-based detections are going to be probably generating more false positives than your signatures, unless your signatures are terrible. And so how do you decide when you have a kind of alert, like out of hours login, you know, login from a new PC, where a lot of times it is going to be a false positive? Uh, what can people do to limit the effects of that well, not just saying, well, I give up and turn it off. Is there some kind of strategy you can use to tune those things to where it's reasonable, but they're not overtuned? That is a great question. And actually, that's part of the art and fun of doing uh, behavioral and signature based together. So that's where correlation can come into play. So it's not if you see one thing, it's if you see three things, you know, and back to banking examples, you know, if you're, uh, you know, trying to access your credit card from Mexico, and it's, you know, I don't know, 3 a.m. in your you know, the town you live in. And, you know, and, and, and the more things you can do that are weird together as a correlation are, are how you tune those uh, kinds of behavioral um, alerts. Yeah. yeah. And also looking between multiple alerts, seeing how they might tie together. So do you see just this one thing? Do you see another piece that comes in here? And I also think there are things you can do on the other side. So if you're getting a, hey, unusual login, you know, from a, a location or a time frame or something else, do you have another out of band method where you could automatically reach out to that person and say, hey, you know, we want to verify, did you actually do this? And, you know, and is this somebody who's you? And so thinking about ways that the SOC can partner with others to get 
feedback on those anomalous alerts that isn't just always the SOC manually having to go in and look at something, but that has some automated process. And again, they need to be out of band. They need to be in a system that wouldn't necessarily be compromised, everything else. Um, but just something to throw out and think about is, um, I think, especially as we go more towards um, identity, more towards, you know, things that are not based on just a, a single alert, and you're going to have this more of this anomalous activity, you've got to figure out those methodologies to not just be doing everything by hand. Yeah. And the other thing I'll throw in here, because this is a good place for it, is this is where things like arch art artificial intelligence um, algorithms and things like that can start to be used, you know, for the experienced analysts, not for the inexperienced analyst, <laughs> but being okay. able to have some kind of augmentation of how you're doing correlation and bringing together different kinds of information. Artificial intelligence can start to help you with, if you combine these three things, they're more likely to be a false positive than these three things, you know. I'd like to I'd like to say a few words about time um, in two different ways in the context of what Ingrid and, and Catherine just mentioned. The first is um, in data collection, um, getting everything that you're collecting from time synchronized uh, is usually a battle that never ends, um, particularly when you have devices set at different time zones. I will take a moment to say um, the truth and the light is usually to set everything in in the kitchen sink to UTC. Um, with that out of the way, no one ever does all of that. And it's usually a, a giant mess. Um, and trying to get it unmessed, uh, it never ends. Ask me how I know. Um, so one of the things to be thoughtful of in, in, in putting together our detections and our collection strategies is ways we can write detections so that we're not over indexing and pun intended. Um, on you know sub second time synchronization and how we write those beautiful detections that roll up all of those lo-fi's together using correlation that we just talked about. Um, the second is you know I've seen a lot of people, myself included. I used to feel very strongly that um, detection, that end-to-end -end latency of data collection needed to be measured in sub second or or sub minute time frames, and that detections need, all needed to be in real time. I have a, a different view today. Um, there are certainly some detection use cases where um, having detections fire in a matter of minutes is very important. However, uh, we see, uh, and thanks to things like, uh, you know, the original kill chain and MITRE TAC and all that good stuff, you know, we see dwell time measured in, in weeks and months. So one of the things to be thoughtful of is that many SOCs I've seen be very uh, effective in leveraging their federated data estate and write detections with up to 24 hour latency because they're written as queries, not highfalutin, super complex, AI, ML, pick your buzzword today, um, you know, amazing NRT bespoke pipelines. They might have them, that's fine. But, you know, think about writing detections with an economy of mechanism because with that economy of mechanism comes the ability to move on to the next detection and the next data feed. So speaking of uh, kind of buzzwords and correlating of data uh, across multiple sources, uh, before we get into to host and network events here, there's one thing I wanted to ask about, uh, that is the buzzword of XDR. Um, that's one of the things that, you know, is a, a newer technology. And uh, before we get into kind of EDR and NDR and all kind of some of those other things that, that are mentioned in the book, um, anything that you want to mention on the emerging technology of, of XDR? I think the first question that always people always ask is, what is it? And why didn't we use it in the book? One of the philosophies you know, we had here, I, I believe in both first and the second edition is we write from experience and what, you know, the authors and the people we've spoken with have hands-on experience with. Um, so for example, you know, in the book, we have a very long section on EDR, which we didn't have in the first edition that comes from experience working with many different EDR products hands-on. In the case of EDR, I think it was Ingrid who was talking about how quickly this space is evolving. And even when we started drafting the second edition, there was tremendous lack of clarity and consensus around what is XDR. In fact, to this day, there's a lot of, uh, I'll, uh, probably some lack of agreement. I'll tell you what I think it is. I think the idea behind XDR is, is that you have a, a platform and set of tools um, that are applied against um, data that's not just coming from the endpoint um, to make sense of that data and do detections on it. 
But that sounds like a seam, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I thought when I first heard it. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I think if you if you dive into it and you start looking at what data is being brought into these XDR platforms, the fact is they're bringing in network data, they're bringing in firewall data, they're bringing in endpoint data. They're doing a lot of the so the data sources that we're talking about and your collection strategy is still in where are you going to get that data and how are you going to bring it in? How long are you going to store it? Everything you're doing. And then what they're talking about with XDR is what type of analytics do you have on top of it? Um, my take is right now XDR is a little bit more optimized for kind of the SOC response lifecycle, where SIM might be a little bit broader in terms of auditing, log retention, some other types of things. And so, but if you think about it, it's still a set of analytics on top of a set of data to try and answer a set of questions. And so even though we don't necessarily talk about it in the book, those concepts are still things that we're addressing, even as we're talking about other tools and other ways to collect and analyze that data. Gotcha. So whether you, you're using XDR or not, right? Obviously, a lot of data that we're collecting is going to come from the endpoint. And, and regardless of the platform it's in, um, that's kind of the next section in the book here, right? Is, is looking at what are we actually collecting from our hosts? Uh, to, to start that discussion, could one of you speak to um, kind of the, the why of host data detection and uh, just a little bit about its importance and where it sits in comparison to like network data? Yeah, I'll start on that one. Um, so host-based data, whether it be in memory or in process or on the node itself in some way, file systems and everything else in a traditional system, um, host-based data is where we go to actually confirm if you have an incident. Network data is good for giving you tips, like this looks pretty bad. I need to go look at this system or this place or this device or whatever it is. Um, but it's only a hint. Uh, it can't actually validate for you uh, that you have an incident. That can only really happen in a host. Is there, when you're going to collect that host data, I, I know in the book you have some kind of categories you break things down to file system activity and like uh, memory and processes and attached devices and IO. And I love that kind of mental model. It's a great way of breaking it down. Um, are there any uh, kind of sources or things that you find yourself going to as like the most important thing that you're constantly looking at on a host? Uh, well, I, I can speak for myself, but I, you know, when I'm doing incident response, the, the in memory stuff has been the most valuable because you can kind of see as things are changing and what's happening that that's, that's weird. That should be a normal systems process or something like that. And it's different than what you think it is, but that, in memory data is super hard to hold on to. It's ephemeral. So it disappears the minute someone's, you know, logged off the system or turned off whatever to, you know, blew away their VM. So it's really hard uh, to get. But for me, that's that's the ideal place is in memory. Yeah, I think it's worth noting, you know, I go back to, to how I thought about the space when I was reading my first books when I got started. And that was where you know, intrusion detection and incident response uh, and security operations generally was so highly conflated with host-based disk forensics. And as Catherine noted, we've come so far um, since those times and since that way of thinking. And that's why um, having a really good EDR that gives you both, um, you know, highly reliable, high fidelity uh, alerts on the host and also gives you a curated set of exactly what she's talking about. Um, you know, host flow, process creation events, log in, log out, registry, if it's a Windows box. Um, you know, those things that you can't collect all of, but if you've got something intelligence on, on the box, that it is collecting the things that are probably the most unusual um, and, the most, and the most interesting. And having that wealth of data at your fingertips um, is tremendously empowering. Um, to the analysts so that they don't have to go doing this highly laborious disk or even memory forensics, uh, you know, after the fact. Um, it is a modern and common expectation. You should be able to see, um, you know, every process creation event for every host in your enterprise and be able to query that in a matter of seconds going back days and weeks. A modern EDR platform is going to give that to you. There's no, there's no reason to not have that anymore. For those who are working on a very, very small budget, even though those tools are now immensely available, uh, is there still 
a usage that you see out there for open source kind of endpoint monitoring tools like the Sysmons and stuff like that? Like if someone actually just can't afford a EDR because it's just super low budget operation, uh, can you string together the kind of host data collection that you would need given given like the, the open source tools that are out there? Absolutely. Um, you know, we spend some time in the book talking about the trade-offs in terms of, you know, uh, buy something off the shelf versus build it from commercial um, solutions. Um, and uh, I would actually advise against taking an absolutist approach saying, you know, we're going to build everything ourselves. We're going to buy everything ourselves. It's usually a mix for almost every stock I run into that they employ a mix of, of capabilities. Um, and one of the, I've seen, I'm not going to name names because I don't think we want to come across as endorsing any specific products. What I will say is that there are lovely open source frameworks that you can put on the host um, and on demand pull host state information that's extremely rich and tremendously, tremendously useful. In fact, indispensable um, when you're doing, you know, post compromise investigation and hunt. Yeah, the one thing I would think about when you're trying to decide, are you going open source? Are you buying stuff or combination thereof is think about the staff and the expertise and how much is involved in maintaining that. Uh, some of the open source tools are awesome. Um, and they also require someone who really knows what they're doing to configure them and maintain them and do all of those things where some of the vendor products, uh, not to endorse anything, but some of the vendor products have done that for you kind of and make it a little easier to maintain. So you have to think about your staff too. One thing uh, I wanted to ask about this, uh, you know, we've been very kind of rosy and sunny about endpoint monitoring here yeah. and saying like, it's what we need. It's what we have to have, right? It gives us so much visibility. Uh, are there any downsides? Are there any warnings? Are there any false assumptions that we should bring up when it comes to monitoring security data from the endpoint? Uh, well, one of the things the SOC needs to be aware of is its uh, privacy promises, privacy rules and regulatory environment. Um, I have encountered SOCs in the past where the lawyers for their enterprise said very extreme things like, you can't collect and retain anything with an IP address more than 48 hours. And I'm like, what? <laughs> um, hopefully no one's lawyers still feel that way. Um, you know, however, in the presence of regulations like GDPR, we do need to be very thoughtful about this. Um, and we need to be very thoughtful about being clear on what those regulations say um, and how we interpret them um, and making sure that um, those regulations have been in, been interpreted by, you know, well-educated and even-handed counsel um, that, you know, kind of weighs, um, you know, what the regulations say in fact, um, you know, the risk environment of the enterprise, um, its risk appetite, um, and it, it can become very nuanced very quickly. So that's that's one set of things to think about. I would also advise, um, you know, there, you know, one of the easy ways to get started going back to the open source versus commercial thing is, is they're like, if you've got some latitude with any tool, you've got commercial or open source or otherwise, is get on a, ho a host with a um, with an open source tool um, that will tell you how many times the registry is touched or the disk is touched, or there's a new um, flow, a new uh, new uh, network um, communication every second, because that is very illuminating and kind of fun if you've never done it before. And that will help you understand, did I really want to turn on that 5157 event on a Windows box? Because you probably don't. <laughs> I would also note that with input, we talked about like, hey, this is your truth. This is your source. This is where you know things are happening. Um, but what happens if your adversary is on that box and they're actually able to turn off the monitoring that you're doing or they're able to impact you know, what you're having? And so it's, it is really important to have, but it can't be the only thing. This is why, you still, we, why we still have network monitoring in the, uh, in the book, why we talk about identity, why we have these other pieces, because it's um, it is a part of the puzzle. It's not the only thing. And there are some adversaries out there that are trying to do things that don't leave footprints on the endpoint. Like, you know, obviously that's going to be a more advanced scenario. That's not going to be your common malware. But um, just recognize that it's it's like a really, really important good thing. But you can't say it's sufficient. You have to have some other things that are you're going to have to be able to monitor around just in case something is compromised within that space. No, it, in Ingrid absolutely nailed it. And this goes back to, again, the SOC must have a variety of different monitoring and data collection capabilities that together 
co help corroborate different things being seen. So you're not just saying, well, I'm going to slap EDR or an open source equivalent on every host and I'm done. You can't do that. You never could do that. And you definitely can't do it today. Rather, you've got to be able to say, I've got identity logs and host logs and cloud logs and app service logs and, 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 and together the SOC sees that complete picture so that when the adversary goes on a box and turns off in a, in EDR or some other tool, you're not totally out of luck. And you see it because you still see the other telemetry that maybe they didn't know about was coming from somewhere else. Yeah, so, and and specifically, you know, one of the examples is when you're um, moving laterally across. Uh, you know, as Ingrid mentioned, you can change that on a particular EDR. So so as you move to another box, uh, you may not have any uh, evidence of that other than from say network traffic or some other weird thing. Why is that box talking to that box? It's uh, a hint that comes from somewhere else. So I totally agree with everything Ingrid and Carson have said. Yeah, so I, I think that's a perfect segue into the next section, which is network monitoring, right? When your host fails you, you gotta, you gotta go somewhere else and, and your uh, your network traffic's probably gonna be that backup hint, right? Mm -hmm. um, could you speak a little bit about the pros and cons of network monitoring? I mean, we've hit some of them already, but any other kind of um, thought process behind the why and the necessity of network monitoring that we haven't hit already? I actually want to address that a little shortly, which is the trends we've seen in this and why we've seen them. Because, um, you know, you go back 20 years and NetFlow was the hotness. It was absolutely what everybody wanted to do. It's how you saw things. At that point, we were still like trying to block particular ports and protocols. It was a great way to look and say, oh, yeah, we've got this open. This is how they're attacking. Hey, there's a, you know, port 10,000 relates to this vendor product. And now people are hitting it, everything else. And then as we started into um, like, Oh, we've closed that down, and we need more, you know, more more data behind it. That's you know, PCAP started uh, became even more important. You wanted to be able to get into the data that was behind it. You wanted to understand what was happening. But now that we we're starting to see the trend of encryption and how much is actually um, limiting what you can see from the actual individual packets, I've noticed that NetFlow is actually making a comeback in some socks, mm -hmm. where they're starting to collect it again because you want to have that trend information you want to have that pattern you may just want to be able to know hey this box was talking to that box that's weird i should go get to my edr um but i think a lot of socks are rediscovering it and finding that it's giving them a large scale set of patterns that are different um and they can retain for a longer period of time it can give you a little bit more ground truth and are different than what you've seen um when you're trying to just capture the pcap so um, I've always liked when you can balance the, the two and you can see there. And then, and then obviously we talk um, a little bit more about um, some of the systems that can collect more of a metadata type approach where it's a little bit more depth than what you're getting out of NetFlow, but it's not your full PCAP and everything else. So I think they all play nicely together. And I, so I would say within the network space, it's not, um, it's not just collecting network traffic in one way. There's actually a lot of ways you can collect it, just like there's a lot of ways you can collect on the endpoint. I'll, I'll offer a, a couple points here. Um... You know, I think the days of collect of deploying sensors on the network that are purely to do passive intrusion detection, um, I wouldn't say are entirely behind us. I think anyone for anyone here to say a given technology is totally dead is probably usually a little too much extremism and hyperbole. Um, what I would rather say is, is uh, to Ingrid's point, there's lots of different ways you can get network telemetry in, and it's very common today to see converged multi-purpose devices. Um, doing network uh, collection today is usually dependent upon having logical places and the enterprise topology to collect that network telemetry. And guess what? When you've gone to the cloud, things get a little weird because you have you don't just have one choke point you have a thousand and um it is um it depends on how your cloud provider does their costing but the default approach is usually the people who own the cloud resources the people who are paying for the network monitoring again this is in an IaaS or kind of non non SaaS type scenario um, so that's one thing to be thoughtful of is, in fact, some um, cloud providers will simply say, hey, for your given cloud stuff, you know, turn on the switch and you'll get something that looks and smells a whole lot like NetFlow. Cool. Um, you know, but again, I have seen so many people do so many wonderful things with layer five through seven traffic metadata. It's super, super neat. 
if you haven't looked at it, it might be worth your time. So how should someone approach um, kind of the same question we talked about before for data retention, but specifically for network data, uh, looking at NetFlow versus metadata versus packet capture? Is there any guidance you would give people on uh, what to keep for how long and maybe if there's a where factor on that mm. uh, where we can point people? I can offer a couple points. First of all, this is a big shift from from edition one to edition two. Um, I think in first edition, I said some pre pretty specific things about how long you should keep, keep PCAP. And I think we put an asterisk in there in second edition. Um, today, really, PCAP retention is an ad hoc thing at best. Um, and the network metadata, traffic metadata layers four through seven, if um, if OSI model is your thing, uh, four and five, if it's not, um, is tremendously, uh, is, uh, sorry, I'm stumbling over my words. Um, being able to summarize that for old data is a huge opportunity to cut retention costs. Huge, huge summarization opportunity for old data. Um, but again, we should go back to one of the points that we made earlier. And that is, is, is if our typical left goalpost is X days, X months or weeks ago, and it is necessary to confirm or refute presence of an adversary only through host data or only through the cloud data where they're, we're not running the host, then guess what? That's the data you're keeping and for quite a long time. You mentioned the uh, the cloud a couple times there. Is there any significant difference in capability to gather NetFlow in the cloud, metadata in the cloud, packet capture in the cloud, or what do you see as, as the typical approach to that as opposed to on-prem collection? There are a couple pieces here. I think we had a whole section in the book about when you go to the cloud, there's some things that are the same and some things are different. And when people, when enterprises start moving into the cloud, it's like we have amnesia and we just forget everything we've learned for the last 25, 30 years of <laughs> IT and security operations. And we're like, how do we do the cloud? There's some things that are the same. In IaaS scenarios, it's typically very similar to the way we're used to doing business on-prem. However, when we move to PaaS and SaaS scenarios um, and other you know, random cloud resource types of, of everything from a key storage to uh, uh, message hubs um, to storage, it's very much at that cloud resource layer and that telemetry tends to be very rich. And it's, it's really cool for the SOC being in that situation when the data is being collected and retained because it's much more targeted and we don't have to be worrying about pesky things like figuring out whether a process has been hooked or whether you know the the file system table has been corrupted in its third copy or such things that make us sad. Yeah, and I think to add, uh, the reason I think we get amnesia and I'm guilty is um, that we don't know what the cloud providers are looking at and storing and collecting for their security operations versus what we're supposed to be um, collecting and storing as customers. So it's really important to work with your cloud providers to really understand that, especially if you're not just an IAS uh, customer, if you're doing a lot more, because IAS is a little bit um, easier to understand from a traditional standpoint of what to do. Um, these other ones are less, less straightforward, less intuitive, so they take conversations. Gotcha. So I guess to close it up here, um, wanted to ask uh, if anyone wanted to, to lend an opinion on the future of data collection, looking at the, the direction things have been going and the way that things are looking now. Uh, we kind of mentioned network going to data, I mean, endpoint going to you know, identity and some of those things. Is that a trend we're going to see continue? Is there any other new data source you see kind of on the horizon or anything kind of future prediction wise you see in this space? Yeah, I, I'll start, I guess. Um, I, I certainly see a trend of, we, we spoke about identity planes and the identity that has become an emphasis. I think that nexus of uh, access or to a resource so that identity and device and resource uh, trifecta is a very interesting thing for security operations. If they haven't already started, look at the application workload and what users are doing with them and that identity and start bringing that picture together in your security operations. 
Yeah, and to build on that, I see it as um, a lot of what we've been able to do in terms of identifying something, we've been able to do it from a single source. Even if you are collecting from multiple sources, a lot of times you're like, oh, this happened, so it gives me this high level of confidence that I should go look for X. And I think we're moving to the point where because we have distributed environments, because people are not um, you know, always in the same place, we don't have, have that same kind of control, um, we're going to have just a lot more anomaly based that's coming in where you're going to need multiple data sources. You're going to have to string them together and we're going to have to learn to live with a level of um, kind of uncertainty and probability around, you know, what is the likelihood that something is wrong. And that's going to become really hard because we're already worried about that false positive, false negative, like those kinds of, of things. And I think that line, that space of the I'm not sure is going to become bigger and bigger. And so it's going to be actually a training opportunity for all of the analysts to say, how do you then investigate, you know, and how do you optimize looking at this information when you aren't just going with a yes or a no? So I think it's really going to be a lot about how we're working with the data, um, as well as the shift in the data sources. I, I completely agree with Ingrid and Catherine as, as usual. Um, I would say one of the ways for the SOC to know it's in people doing investigations are kind of in a healthy place is that for a given investigator responder that's been there for a while, they should be conversant in dozens of data sources, whether or not the SOC holds those or whether they're somewhere else in the enterprise, dozens, not just one or two dozens. And if you don't feel like that way, chances are you haven't spidered out, um, you know, in, into those different, those different things worth looking at and collecting. Um, I would say one of the ways I think about summary the, summarizing this area is, um, the we look at the big V's of big data, uh, volume, uh, velocity, veracity. Uh, wait, hold on a second. I got to do this again. Volume, variety, velocity, veracity. And I would see three of those are most certainly increasing for every sock. The one that I would argue might be held relatively constant is veracity. All right. So a lot of interesting stuff going on in this space, right? We have multiple different data sources. We got AI on the horizon. We got identity coming up as a, as a big player. Um, again, I wanted to, to reemphasize to the listeners here that this chapter is enormous and it is full of just nuggets of wisdom here. And we got some of those out here on the episode, but I don't want anyone to miss it. So uh, definitely check out and, and read this chapter as a companion to, to listening to this episode if you haven't already. All right. Uh, I think that brings us to the end here. Uh, again, I appreciate all of you joining me on your weekends. I know that the listeners appreciate it as well. I think we had some some really interesting kind of tips and tidbits for everyone here on the uh, the nature of data collection now in 2023 and, and the direction we're going with it. So uh, on the next episode, we're going to be covering uh, the chapter eight, leverage tools to support your analyst uh, workflow uh, chapter, which is going to be an interesting discussion. I'm, I, uh, as Carson would say, I have feelings <laughs> <laughs> about a lot of tools that, that go on in the SOC and usability and all the stuff that goes with it. So I'm very, very excited to, uh, to get that episode uh, coming up here as well. So uh, with that, I will leave everyone to their weekend. And thanks again for joining us. And we will see everyone again on the next episode of Blueprint. Bye.